honored to present our Animal Matters speaker for today, Karen Pryor. Um, the impact of Karen on uh, animal training over the last 40 years cannot be overstated. Uh, beginning with dolphins and going on to horses and dogs and all kinds of other animals, um, Karen has been a pioneer both in clicker training and generally in the use of positive reinforcement and force-free training on animals of all kinds. Um, she is the author of nine books, many articles, the founder of Karen Fire Academy, and, uh, and a presence for all of us. So we are so pleased that she was able to come here today and talk to you. Well, thank you. Karen. Good morning, all. Thank you, Alan. So I've all been interested very much in, in behavior and the vet world from the time I was an undergraduate at Cornell. We had a big vet school. I spoke at that vet school a couple of years ago. They still don't have a course on behavior. Oh, well. Most people do, but many do not. It's a kind of a new issue. So I'm not going to stress that, but I don't think it has, I think it's a pleasure and an honor to be talking to this audience on a pet subject of mine. Great, because I'll come around to that again. Things have changed a lot since I was at Cornell for veterinarians. The practice has changed. It used to be more rural and large animals now, much more small animals. It used to be only men. My college roommate wanted to be a vet, and they wouldn't let her because she was a girl. Uh, that's changed. Good thing. Um, the pet owners, I'm sorry, I'm learning the technology. Don't stand in front of it. You've got to be here where it can read you. Huh. The pet owners have changed. And you may have seen this yourselves in the last 10 years, some of you, 10, 15 years. It used to be that, that what you're seeing now that to me is very different from what I grew up with is that people come in. They have pets. They have gotten a dog. They never had a dog before. They never had a dog in the family. They don't have the faintest idea. They can barely tell which and goes out the door first. Uh, they're really uh, unequipped to deal with, with the dog. They may have uh, taken a pointer to be an apartment dog in the 64th floor of a New York building. You know, they don't really have much dog sense. And they need help. Um, and then the other thing that's changed about them is that they do have a lot of romantic illusions. First of all, that it is holier and more noble to rescue a dog from the shelter than to start with a dog that has a relatively predictable way of behaving because it's a breed of some kind. Uh, they may feel that there's a strong element in the public of, I can save this dog with love. No other tools. That's not quite enough. Uh, so you have dogs coming in, you have new pets, you have pets coming in from the shelter that may be quite un unprepared to be a pet, uh, and the owners don't quite know what to do about that. So that falls on the vet's shoulders where it never did before, uh, and it's very interesting. It's very interesting to me, working with those shelter dogs and turning them into livable pets. That's a really interesting question. The training has changed. Just to take the dogs, training used to mean sit, stay, down, come, and heal, period. And when I tell it to you. And if I yell louder, you do it faster. That was basically what people learned in dog training, right? None of that applies to those shelter dogs. Once the event marker came into the system, once the noise or light or whatever that tells the animal, aha, you win a prize, what you just did, that wins, you win. It's much more keyed to how animals explore and discover what works for them in nature. Way down, way down to a lot of lower animals, too. Um, we train very differently now. We really do. What all of the animals, they learn, they learn as a collegial effort between them and us. And uh, uh, I just put this picture up here because this is a social greeting from a goat I don't know. But I had just taught this goat that touching its nose to the red target is a big payoff. And so we jumped over things, and we went under things. And in five minutes, this goat thought I was wonderful. And so when I sat down, we said hello, breath exchange. Horses do that, too, as a greeting. Um, this key 
This is the key to the training, the modern training. Think about what you want to get, not what you want to stop. And that's a big turnaround for a lot of people too, even parents, you know. So that, that's the basic behind. So let me give you a quick crash course in clicker training. The technical name is the event marker. Another common name in some other fields is success-based training. That is, every time the animal hears, or the learner, whatever the species, humans included, when you hear the click, it identifies exactly what your muscles were doing at that moment. And you go, oh, oh, that worked. I get my thing when I hear that. I get my cookie, whatever it might be. So the animal is always successful whenever it can be a very exciting experience, a series of successes with new, new skills that you're building fast. I started out as a naturalist. I was a biologist, field biologist, as soon as I could run around un unobserved, un unguarded in the fields. I collected butterflies, I bred fish, I studied the birds, I knew the squirrels in my neighborhood personally. I still do, actually, not all of them, some of them. Um, and that's the way I was going. I never intended to be a trainer. I was happily, I was happily getting a graduate degree in marine invertebrate zoology, and I could have been fooling around with uh, crayfish and nudibranchs and things happily for the rest of my life, I expect. And, but I was the only person at Sea Life Park, this company in Hawaii was started by my husband, I was the only person there who had ever trained anything. And I had trained one pony and a dog by conventional methods. Uh, so they handed me a little manuscript, 20 pages, on operant conditioning, and I was hooked. I didn't know I would be hooked for life, but I was. These animals, just take a look at this. This is Stenella attenuata, the Pacific spotted dolphin. Uh, this is not an animal you can safely keep in captivity because they're so fragile and so hysterical and nervous uh, that they don't work out. This, but just, just want to point out, we did it because clicker training works. And the animals loved it. This is very early training. Uh, and I'm kind of laughing at the little female because she's afraid of the bar. The male is, ha, I can do this, and she's kind of, do I have to, oh, do I have to, oh, well, okay. Uh, just because he did it, she'll do it. Um, this is not Flipper, right? Flipper is gray. This is a different animal, different, and twice as big and twice as heavy, just so you know. This is the key, key tool, is that marker, that signal that is not like anything else in the environment that says um, you win. That's how we train the dolphins. And that's where this technology stayed with the marine mammals. It stayed there. It started, I picked it up first in 63. The very first uh, dolphin things were happening around the country. Um, this is the one I learned at, I taught at too. That's the shows I developed. The Navy was using it with sea lions. They use it now. They use it now for all kinds of open ocean work with dolphins and small whales and particularly these uh, very versatile sea lions. This wonderful technology, we showed it in shows after shows. We taught it, we wrote about it. I did anyway, and uh, nobody picked it up. Well, I don't have a sea lion, I don't have a dolphin, so I don't need that. People did not make that jump mentally. I never could understand. So I wrote a book, figuring out, as soon as I'd explained how to do this, everybody would understand how to do this. And everybody's basically, all oh, those smart dolphins, aren't they fun? Not my dog, not my husband, not my dental practice, not my practical real life. That changed, began to change in San Francisco in 1992. Uh, this was my second textbook. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, that, that was second attempt to explain how it works. This has become the basic text on modern training, and you can get it anywhere. Um, Phil Heinlein, the head of Behavior Analysis, Association for Behavior Analysis, invited me to come and talk at a, their big annual conference, and I brought clickers. And the clickers became the talisman for this kind of training. Uh, dog people came to that conference. Dog people, I gave, started asking for seminars, and we were off and flying. That became a company. This is the company. You can find it. It's got a publishing arm. It's got a website with a store. It's got an online teaching program. And, uh, uh, that's the academy. 
And it's got a, or twice a year big conferences, big conferences um, that are really the hotbed of the advance of the technology. That's where really all the front edge people are, and it's a lot of fun. This is a, this, these are uh, service dogs in an advanced class at Clicker Expo, uh, learning something or other from Ken Ramirez here, who is now the uh, co-partner running, uh, my, running my company. I, I backed out of it last year, sold it. Uh, so I could do this kind of thing. There, OK, here I want to talk a little bit about how this technology has spread. Just, it's really the virus. I mean, it really is a meme. It goes from one person to another. It doesn't go through the laboratories and out into the published literature. So we need more published literature, but the, that's not where it goes. It just goes here. I can, let me show you. Well, you can do this. Conservation, this, it changed uh, because of the ability of anybody to pick up a clicker and a handful of kibble and teach their dog to follow a smell, no matter what that smell is. So for field work, for counting populations of a rare animal, for locating, uh, here are some of the studies that I'm just aware of because they come in in my inbox. Uh, rare foxes is a little fox in California with great big ears that's an endangered or at risk species. Um, teach the dog to smell out the scat of the fox, that fox, not some other kind of fox, not coyotes, not dogs, just those little big eared foxes. And he will find them. And you'll click for every find, and pretty soon you can tell. And also, you can ask him, only tell me once about this particular fox. How many different foxes can you find? You can add that into the rules, and uh, they'll count the foxes for you. Same box turtles. I've seen turtles working, in, uh, seeing sniffer dogs working in the swamps and finding little teeny, teeny turtles as well as big turtles. And a wonderful way to locate the species that you're trying to study that's hard to find. Snow leopards, that's another one. That's, they find them by scat. They never see them, but they sure do know when they left some message behind. Uh, uh, sniffer dog, well, I'll tell you, in the, Louis in the big Gulf oil spill, um, one of the risk, things at risk were, were turtle nests full of eggs on an on a oil-washed beach. And what they were afraid of was that they would lose the whole year's supply of, of baby turtles coming out of those nests. It's hard to find them yourself, uh, but the dogs could find them. Uh, Ken Ramirez, our new partner at uh, uh, Karen Pryor Clicker Training, um, took the contract and they went down there with dogs and asked the dogs, that's what we want, see, smell that, that's turtle eggs, that's what we want. They found uh, enough eggs to save 29,000 eggs, moved them to Florida, and they hatched in Florida. Now, those turtles will be a new population, but they're in the same gulf. Um, a wonderful piece of conservation work. Here are some of the other things that you can do easily with a clicker, with shaping, with reinforcement, as long as you leave the scolding and correction out, which makes your animal just shut down and wait to be told what to do. Let them experiment. Here are, here are some of these practical things that are out and running in the public now. Uh, support dogs, Great Dane, that help somebody walk along who can't hold themselves up very well. Uh, PTSD, companion dogs, that's a special piece of training to keep the, get the vet who's got post-traumatic stress disorder out into public comfortably. Uh, detection dogs, this is medical dogs. Diabetes, epilepsy, when your blood sugar goes up or down, the dog can tell you. When you are coming on with an epilepsy event, the dog can warn you, and you'll lie down, so you don't have a bad fall. Uh, locating cancer, there have been a lot of anecdotal stuff about that. Uh, pet dogs finding things that you shouldn't be, the smelling funny things. That turns out to be a very realistic thing for dogs to do. Actually, you can train rats to do it too, but people accept the dogs more, right? Uh, <laughs> The customs beagles, uh, I've been caught by one because I had been in a dog, uh, uh, working with dogs in England. And, and uh, when I got, off the, got into customs, here came the beagles. Oh, it's sitting next to me. What's the matter? I don't have any contraband with me. I don't have anything. It's usually fruit uh, and meat that the dogs, the, the beagles are trained to look for. But they use beagles now because um, 
they're friendly and doesn't scare people the way a great big ugly terrifying Doberman or German Shepherd might frighten you. And you don't train them with, you have to train them positively. Beagles don't work for, for, for out of fear. They leave, but they don't work. Uh, but they will work for kibble, of course, or something better. Um, KLM Airlines has, um, has dogs that will track from a found object in the airplane after the passengers leave, a laptop in the backpack, pocket in front of you, or a child's toy, you know, or some treasured item. Um, he can air scent, full gallop, find them before they leave the airport. And behind them comes the handler with the lost object, <laughs> catching, running after the dog. But he can find them. He can find them. Uh, they've got five or six of those little dogs. Quiet Kennels Protocol, I won't go into this too much, but uh, these are the steps for shutting up a whole barking kennel. I'm doing a piece of research now in, uh, with a group of um, master's thesis students in New York at Hunter College. Uh, and I'm doing it, taking it and elsewhere, too. We get a bunch of shelters and demonstrate that you can do this and that it works. Uh, this is why it works. And they are learning impulse control. And you can do it, you can do it the first round you can do in about 10 minutes uh, with, say, 20 dogs that are all barking. I'm galloping here a little because I think, wait a minute, I guess I sort of want to go back to that. Would anybody like to talk about that a little more questions? Has anybody done it? One, two, three. Yeah, wonderful. How many of you, while I'm asking questions, how many of you are all already using Clicker? That's great. And uh, how many of you have thought about it but haven't tried? That's great. Um, there is a new textbook. I just got this this week. And uh, for those of you who are experienced and starting out or thinking about it, this is called Canine and Feline Behavior for Veterinary Technicians and Nurses. It's a tremendously thorough, everything from nutrition, temperament, medication, and so on. But it also has, running all the way through it, a very good introduction to marker-based training and how to use it in the vet practice. The two uh, editors and authors, uh, Julie Shaw and Debbie Martin, are uh, certified vet techs. And they are wonderful writers. And they have both been faculty members for our around the country uh, uh, professional teaching program. And they can write. What a nice gift. Thank you. It's clear. It's fun to read. So I'm going to put this here. You can take a look at it afterwards. But I really think that uh, this is a wonderful front door in. Uh, and we also have some courses. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Marker best training is nice for our dogs. And it has, and cats, of course. Um, they think they're training you to produce food, uh, which they are. It's an entirely symbiotic relationship. Uh, this was uh, one of the places where it has penetrated most powerfully and most effectively, one by one, keeper to keeper. Uh, and that is working with the physical care, the husbandry, of animals in the zoo. Until recently, the only that you know, you, you, if you wanted to uh, vaccinate uh, your tiger, uh, all your big cats against uh, uh, feline distemper or whatever the cat diseases are that come in. They get those. And there's feral cats in all the zoos. Um, what do you do? You have to immobilize it chemically or physically. And that's a nightmare with a tiger, because they fight. And they hurt themselves and break their teeth and stuff when you squeeze cage them. Uh, what about rhinos? And I consulted to the National Zoo some years and many years ago, in, in the early 80s, late 70s, um, about bringing operant training into their handling. And uh, one of the, we had an operant rhino and her, and her calf, too, that would come and go on a queue and learn, and were docile. You could touch them. You could, you could, do, you could handle them easily. And, uh, and she had turned out. Uh, bovine uh, tuberculosis, and they had to put them both down. 
an expensive loss, and very sad too, they were very sweet animals. Uh, nowadays, you, if, if that rhino needed a shot every blessed day for the rest of its life, you could train it. Give me your shoulder, there's your medicine today, and the keepers can do it. Nobody else has to, has to be involved. So I would like to show you, so it has made such a change. Here is a species, this is a Garanook. Anybody know this animal? Alan knows it. It's a very unusual antelope. Uh, on the ground it looks like an antelope, but this, I mean normal, but this animal, this is this normal feeding position. They are overhead browsers. And they have uh, like a, a different solution to a giraffe. For either, this is the long skinny legs. Those long skinny legs are very fragile, and these animals panic very easily, and they run into the walls and break their legs. And that's the end of that. You can't fix them. So they're hard to keep in zoos, they're hard to breed, and they are rare, and it's a terrible pity. This keeper at the St. Louis Zoo, I think I took this, um, she's clicker trained this the Garanook to to stand and hold his posture there in his feeding position where he felt safest. And now you can draw blood, you can look at his teeth, you can medicate him, you can va if vaccinate him if you need to. You can have him come and go to the target of just your hand. Uh, and he's calm. He's a calm animal now. It, it, it translates into the animal is in charge. He can leave anytime he wants to. And as soon as she shows him that, She's run out of food. He does leave. See ya. This is strictly a business exchange from his standpoint. But it is, it is saving these animals, making them safe to handle. How about a video? Oh, how old-fashioned. We're going to use the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is a rhino. And the keeper asked, asked, invited me back to see what she had taught the rhino. She, she has taught him some obedience behaviors. Um, She's using a silent whistle. I'm not sure if you can hear it. Uh, but that's her bridge. That's her marker, her event marker. And she has taught him. Now she's going to show me that the rhino knows how to sit. He's a little ill at ease because I'm in the back with her, and he's not used to seeing strangers. So if not ill at ease, he's distracted by looking at me. Here's the big cue for a rhino's big behavior, sit. Oh, he wasn't looking. Oh, there he goes. Good boy, right. Now she's got a hand signal for a visual cue for down. And over. Well, this looks like a, a, a little bit undignified to do, but this is a wonderful position in which you can trim the feet. And just like elephants and horses, the feet grow too much in captivity, trimming off those hooves, that uh, extra tissue in the, the uh, fingernails, basically. She's showing me where you, she can also draw blood in this position, from the inside of the front leg elbow. And she did it right in front of me. I believe her. This rhino and this keeper are friends. It's not pets at all. It's kind of an association that they have together. Um, and there again, now, compared to the rhino that couldn't be kept alive because she had a germ, this rhino has a long and happy life ahead of him. Calm, too. Calm. Having these animals not afraid, liking their keepers, enjoying the interaction. Oh, boy. That's really important and different. Uh, this video just came to me. Let me show you another thing I think is fundamental to getting out that event marker and using it effectively is that the first thing the animals learn is impulse control. They learn to, they learn what they don't need to do anymore. That's why the quiet kennels work so well. Oh, I don't need to bark. Oh, wait, there's other things I can do. So this is a little snake, a youngster, and uh, they are using a target to teach her to touch a target. That means you can have her follow the target from one place to another instead of having to hook them and put them in a bag and scare them to death and so on, get them all upset. You can follow a target. This is from the Bronx Zoo. I want to tell you that the first targeted animals they trained when we got a trainer in there that really knew her business, the crocodiles, the Nile crocodiles, 
if you wanted to move this animal so you could clean his festering pool, it took four men, it took a stretcher, it took a lot of duct tape and guts. Somebody goes in there and duct tapes the mouth before the crocodile notices what's happening. And then you have to tape him to the stretcher and then you have to carry him. And he's thrashing and frightened to death. I mean, this is terribly frightening. And all of that happens like once every two years, right, if you want to do it. And they've got five, four or five of them. Uh, what are you going to do? They target trained the, the uh, crocodiles to touch a frisbee on a pole and follow it down the hall. And now you can lead the crocodiles to another pool and back out to this one when you want to put them back after you have cleaned it. You know, it, it's amazing to me. Maybe we don't have to be kind to reptiles, but I think it's worth it. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I changed the video help. <laughs> I want to go back. I don't want that. I want to go back to the snake. So we, and now, how do we make it go? Oh, there we go. All right. So here's this female. We, we just, they discovered that they needed a visual moving target. So the end of the hook there is her target. She touched the target with her nose, and the click is a flicking move of the target itself. You give her plenty of time. We don't need to be in a hurry with her. Oh, there's my target. Touch it. And it flips, and now she gets a mouse, and she strikes, and she stops herself and takes it politely. Oh, I don't need to strike. Wait, I'll just take it. That's impulse inhibition in a snake. Isn't that cool? I would not have, you know, they're always surprising me. I just think that's so awesome. The snake thought it over. I mean, what are you going to say? I know that sounds very anthropomorphic, but she inhibited that. Uh, this, by the way, is a three, four-month-old baby king cobra. She's going to be a big lady. And when she grows up, she's going to be a clicker-trained cobra. And she's going to be a lot safer to have around, really. At this age, by the way, they're just as toxic. But not that one, you know? She knows how to inhibit her bite. Isn't that great? Right? OK. Um, this is a whole thing I'm not going to go into, but there's a, 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 which is the development of ways of training animals to be creative. Uh, I, the paper that I wrote about dolphins in the 60s uh, has the standard literature on that um, procedure and how it was done. Uh, now it's done all over the place just for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and we're just beginning to you know, put that on paper and, and get some stuff in the literature about why this works and how it works and what the history is and so on. Um, innovative training is become very popular in the zoos. The Bronx Zoo has uh, 10 different species of animals that will play this game. The game is essentially, show me something new. Show me something that hasn't been reinforced before. And one of the most popular animals to do that with is gorillas, especially young male gorillas. They are adolescent and full of beans and full of mischief, and they don't have enough to do, and they get into all kinds of trouble. So this was, uh, the, the gorilla you're going to see here is an adult male. He's now a silverback, but he was a young trouble. This is little Joe from the uh, Franklin Park Zoo in Boston. Nope, it didn't work. It changed. It changed the picture instead of starting the video. OK, there we are. That has a special place. All right. I hope you can hear the soundtrack on this. This is just going through ordinary medical care behaviors. I'm watching this keeper practicing medical care behavior with her gorilla. But sometimes they play a game, too. Show me something new. Show me something different. He has to come up with something he has not been trained to do. And he's very creative. Now that you did that. No, you did that too. No, you did that too.
Just... <laughs> that is a, virilla, a gorilla's eye. They have a rather crude sense of humor, but it's very real. That's a joke. That's me talking to her. Yeah, it's really positive for, you know, and he really enjoys it. And it's very possible for that reason. We give them all the blue shots the same way. You know, you give the blue shot, ask you to shoulder. Don't show them to hold it. You just give it to them. But yeah, you know, they're a lot tougher than we are. Usually if it's done. Um, and if we're going to inject them, we'd have to have like candy or something a little sweeter. Right. Or fun. So much that if we found something colorful or an attack into the movie, your shoulder immediately. Like, <laughs> 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 That's cute. That's funny. So, I mean, it doesn't really bother me at all. See, the, the camaraderie <laughs> is hard to miss. And uh, the bribe, the bribe, the reinforcer, the actual payoff is, is uh, uh, kittle, Skittles. Those little gummy bear things, that's what he chooses. He can change his choice if he wants to. He have whatever he likes. Um, all of the gorillas at most zoos will now go through all of these behaviors for you. Get on the scales, come over and take their shots, and so on. I think it's wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> some of these, I want to show you that some of this is not limited to uh, animals with large brains at all. Uh, this is a, a student of mine who now is, works for, for us at uh, KPCT. She did a, this was a, she was at the Marine Lab, the Cornell Marine Lab, and she did a, said she wanted to train the crabs, and she wanted to train a crab to ring a bell. I had written about this, and she heard about it, read it, and said, okay, I can do that too. The crabs are uh, portuned crabs. This is a green crab, and the I'm going to use this. This is the research tank. Um, the animal has to go from this end to that end and bring this hanging object, knock it as if it were ringing a bell. And, and you have to move them, of course, from one end of the, uh, the holding tank into this tank to work. You can leave them in there. They'll get detrained, so to speak. But the behavior is very easy to achieve. Here is the crab knocking the hanging weight with a claw. Uh, this took two minutes twice in two days, one minute, one two minute session one day, one two minute session the next day, and the animal had, had it. You put it in here, it rushes over, rings the bell, click, treat. The click in this case is the flash of the forceps that are delivering the treat, the movement of the forceps. And we don't know if it's the light on the forceps or the sight of the movement, you know, we really can't tell, but it's, it works anyway, so. However, in the beginning, uh, being lifted from one tank to another was re re brought out a lot of anxiety on the part of the crab. I mean, this is like a seagull just picked me up and is carrying me away and I'm doomed. Snapping claws, waving legs, see the leg up in the air, all small parts shut down tight. Um, this is a frightened to death crab. However, once they had learned, and I'm saying only two training sessions and three, the third day, which was photography day, crab goes from one tank to the other completely calm. Legs are totally relaxed, mouth is open, eyes are around, the stocks are out, you know, she, the, I know where I'm going and it's very cool, so let's hurry up. <laughs> um, this relaxed confidence is an outcome that we see over and over. And I've seen it in so many dog, and so many cats, and so many dog owners. Oh my goodness, the trainer calms down and becomes relaxed and confident. It's a universal outcome, even with a crab. I find that that's something that I find very interesting. I just want to kind of sum that up. Traditional correction-based learner is a good soldier. Yes, sir. And do nothing else but what I told you to do. And do it right and do it well. 
They are withdrawn. They are waiting to be told what to do. They only play and gamble and explore and do new things on their own time. That's not considered a trained animal that's running around on its own time. The marker-based learner becomes all these green things. Focused, confident, enthusiastic, exploratory, cooperative, and cheerful. We want exploratory. We want the animal to be thinking, oh, what else could I do? What else do you think might work? That's what it would be doing in nature, trying to figure out, if it's a young coyote, how to catch mice in a field. You know, you have to explore. You have to find out that running after them barking doesn't work at all. But stalking quietly, this actually works. They, you can hear the rustle in the grass, and then you got one. Um, they have to learn those things. That doesn't come hardwired. Um, and that's true you know, even for fish learning to forage and so forth. There's a surprising amount that goes on. The success of their first attempts um, is, is tremendously powerfully reinforcing. And you get this sort of grown-up animal. It's because, ah, I'm here. I can do it. I can do this. Watch me. Um, and that's not just with animals. So it took me a long time to realize that I knew that the trainers change. They'll tell you. Well, you know, my life changed when I learned to do this and I stopped doing it. A dentist once told me that he raised German shepherds and that's what he learned the clicker training for. And he said, and I, I realized one day, you know, that I stopped jerking my dogs around, but look what I'm still doing with my kids, not to mention my employees. And once you see it, you can't unsee it, so you have to start thinking, oh, instead of trying to stop what I don't want, maybe I should be looking for what I do want and building that, and then, you've, and then you are off and running. It's very creative work. Um, so I, I, I knew that that change happened, but I didn't see it so dramatically until we started uh, working with people a couple of years ago now, more directly, more directly, really studying. This was the only, this, where are you, wait. This was the only paper on create, training for creativity, came out in 69, and that was the only thing written about that with animals for 44 years. Took a little while, last year, uh, Sheila Chase at Hunter and I came out with an update, which you can find online, uh, just beginning to, beginning to crack open the fact that we all know perfectly well that animals can do this. They're very good at taking on variability of behavior and, in, and exploiting it for their own needs. And that doesn't, uh, it, it's something that it's something that there really needs to be more research about. The people who have demonstrated it most, I don't remember where the next slide is. Wait a second. The people who've demonstrated this most are the field biologists who have observed it. Once you could get over being accused of anthropomorphism for saying that animals are being creative, once, once you could get at least step outside of that attack page, um, then they were allowed to report not just as anecdotes, but as observations by a trained biologist that, yes, I saw this orangs find 14 new ways to get out of water besides what they were already doing, to get water out of leaves and stuff. Uh, whatever it would be, birds innovate, um, small animals innovate, turtles imitate. You know, it's, it's kind of widespread. It's kind of the ability to vary your behavior and then take advantage of news from the environment. And that paid off. Uh, that ability is, is much wider than just in the cognitive super smart animals. And I think that's pretty exciting too. So practice has changed. People have changed. They come in the door. The pets have changed. And we're changing too. These are some sources for self-teaching. We have several online courses uh, that are popular. This is the website. Several of these courses are very successful with everybody. The Foundations course is called the Dog Trainer Foundations course. The Puppy Start Right is uh, the same authors that did this book have developed an online course for socializing and teaching 
people to teach their own puppies. Uh, that's also been very successful. And this, we have shelter training and enrichment <coughs> course. We just came back from Western Vets uh, Conference. And uh, the people who sat there told me that what they got was a lot of people interested in cats, in cats. And this is our best source of uh, enrichment, caring for, overcoming fear, and so forth with cats in confinement shelters, like shelter cats. It was that I met just this morning who's getting her master's on, uh, on uh, yeah, on, on, on judging feline cats and finding out which ones can make good pets and then turning them into good, good pets. That's a great, great project. There's the book. Um, I, this is one of the, my, uh, now that I have retired from the company and sold my stock to my partners, I have time to play. And so for me, that's exploring. And uh, it has been partly continuing research with creativity, demonstrating that and working with the Hunter students, but, uh, but also with people. And this uh, came to me out of the blue, a phone call from a, uh, a man named Martin Levy who competes in agility with four collies, and uh, called me to say that he'd been looking at the clicker, very successful clicker trainer, and he does a lot of teaching too. And he looked at it and he said, you know, and I've heard this before, I could use this in my day job. It's rare that people make that jump. It's amazingly rare. I don't know why it's so hard. But his day job is as an orthopedic surgeon. And he doesn't like, and he doesn't like the way they, they are in the cust have customary system for training surgeons to be. It involves a lot of yelling and correction and punishment for errors and humiliation, savage. Uh, it's traditional, and it has been traditional for, I don't know, five, ten centuries. This is the way you train young doctors. You scare them to death so they'll know it's scary. They know it's scary already. You know the business they're going into? Yeah, it's risky. Uh, so Marty wanted me to do something about making a, he was going around lecturing to, to and never mind, he, he was going around lecturing to other surgeons about how we should use, train the students the way we train our dogs, and sure, Marty, nobody listened to that. So uh, we, I made some suggestions, you know, find something that isn't working now, and set up a pilot program. Didn't hear from him for six months, and then he called back, Karen, here's what we're going to do. And by gosh, we're now in the second year of doing it developed a step-by-step -step clicker training design for training tool use. Some 20 different, 30 different tools that you use as an orthopedic surgeon. Just the tools, not the medicine, not the anatomy, how you use the tools. You want to drill a hole, how deep, at what angle. You should be able to do that before they hand you a drill in the operating room and say, here, you try it. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the uh, title of the program. There's no punishment. There's no yelling. These are four-hour labs, 24-hour labs over four weeks. Uh, they love it, and they gradually, gladly giving, giving up the four hours a day, 7 to 11, during their ordinary heavy working day. Um, we've graduated quite a few through this program now. Teresa McKeon is also involved. She's the head of the human tag teaching mentioned her today. Um, they work in pairs, one with the clicker. When it's a it's, you don't use a clicker all the time. A lot of things you don't need it for. Very precise movements, shifting your weight, whole, how you hold something in a delicate, difficult use of the tool, that the clicker is perfect for. So working in pairs, click each other. It builds trust. The labs are taught by younger surgeons, but who are already practicing. We're training them, too. Um, it's entirely positive. There's a very high rate of experience of success in those four hours over this and that. And another way of you'll have five or six different things that you learn to do during that time. Uh, you, have, you come out of there like those crabs, happy and confident. Yes, I know how to do this. I, uh, I took these shots in the lab. I also have learned to use a couple of these tools and saw an absolutely straight line uh, off of, you know, you're gonna, it's a lot of fun. It's really a lot of fun. Uh, and what, what I didn't realize, and this is where I'm going to end, 
What I didn't realize was that it trains the trainers and it trains the people and we all change. The air, these students go through the hospitals with their shoulders back, their spines relaxed and a smile on their face. The normal medical student is exhausted and stressed out and worried he's going to get yelled at. And they, have, they have calm, confident people, just like those calm, confident crabs. And that high rate of success has something to do with it. Um, they are also useful because they know how to use all the tools very well already. Uh, so they get called in to help in the operating room. They get greeted in the halls by name by senior surgeons. Hi, Rachel. How are you today? Fine. Thank you, doctor. That's not what used to happen six months ago, a year ago. No, it was kind of, intern, get in here. Do this. What do you mean you don't know how to do it? You know, it was, it was a different style. And uh, it's, it's like measles at, at, at really at Disneyland. Boom. <laughs> it's going through the whole hospital. <laughs> so that's a happy expect <laughs> that I didn't expect. <laughs> and that's. All I'm going to say, but at our time we have a few minutes for no, we don't really have a few minutes for questions. But anybody want to comment or criticize? <laughs> so these are exciting times. So thanks for coming.